Well, he's a rugby league legend himself. We see him across Fox Sport, of course, all the programs, calling the games as well. Greg Alexander back on our program on the platform. What a warm welcome back to the show to you, mate. Thank you. Uh, no problem, Martin. Good to talk. All right, let's talk first and foremost about the game of tonight, Panthers-Eels. And we all know how difficult it is to win one at Premiership, Greg. Uh, going back-to-back back is almost a nigh-impossible ask. Finding, you know, hitting, uh, uh, getting in there three years in a row is just something that only the Storm have done recently. This Panthers side, best team in the comp, but does that count for anything tonight? Uh, it probably, well, it, it's got to count for something, huh? but I don't know how much it counts for. And the fact that the Eels have beaten the Panthers twice this year and Penrith have only lost four games um, means that there is something about this Parramatta side that um, they seem to have an answer for what Penrith throw at them. So I, as a Penrith man, I'm, I'm extremely worried about tonight. Um, and then there's a, a whole lot of factors to take into into account the fact that Nathan Cleary hasn't played footy for five weeks. Jerome Lewis had one game, and that was two weeks ago in five weeks. Uh, the whole side was rested for the the last regular season game. We don't know, you know, we won't know until full time whether that's been the right rain to pull or, or not. So there's a lot of question marks about the Panthers, despite them being runaway minor premiership winners. Uh, and I, I think a lot of it revolves around the strength and the individuals of this, this Eels outfit. Can you had, gain a lot of confidence from the fact, though, that you know the same men are in charge that have been in charge the last couple of seasons, and if anything, they know what they are doing come finals time. That must actually be give you a good sort of boost. Uh, well, that, that is one of the you know that's one of the positives, but but it's also one of the things. Yes, it, it puts them in in good stead, having been there the last couple of years. But you yourself, you know, open by saying how tough it is to go back to back. And uh, yeah, I, I think people probably forget last year that Penrith had to go the hard way around. That they 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 lost week one of the finals and then had to get through um, you know a couple of elimination weekends to get to the grand final, then win it again. So. Uh, I've got a feeling, I, 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 and I've just felt it for most of the season, that the, the sides can beat the Panthers, are Melbourne and the Eels. Now, uh, what you make of that and, and how that will end up come grand final day, I don't know. But uh, the Eels have got some, some players in terrific form. Dylan Brown, just one of them. Greg, before we get on to the other games, how you know how much of it? Just listening to you there is actually self belief and confidence. When you're a team like the Eels, you know you're looking at the minor prems, you're looking at the champions, but you're saying, "Hey, on a on a field of grass, our thirteen beat these thirteen, and we did it twice." Enormous, and and that's that's the concern I think for Penrith and their fans that that the Eels don't there's. They're not beaten before they get out there. And then that happens, uh, you know, a number of times with sides that have been so dominant uh, and can look invincible. But that's not how the Eels perceive the Panthers. So, you know, I heard Dylan Brown talk about the fact that they want Penrith at their strongest because they feel good enough, whatever Penrith throw out there, that they can get the job done. So it's a very confident Eels outfit with their key players in break form. Gutherson, Moses, Brown, uh, the back rowers, Papali'i and Sean Lane being incredible, and then the two men up front. So there's a lot to overcome for the Panthers. All right, then, let's look at Saturday night, tomorrow night, and that's the Storm Raiders, Sharks, Cowboys. And that first game, you know, it's got the parallel with Panthers Eels because the Raiders have beaten the Storm a couple of times, and one thing that they don't fear is playing in Melbourne. No, that's right. One of those quirky things that, uh, you know, a side just happens to hold over. A side, that, that there would be very few sides in the competition that would have a good record in Melbourne. Actually, I, re- I reckon that the Raiders are the only side that have got a great record in Melbourne. Some of the, the rest of the top eight mightn't even do that. So, um, yeah, they find themselves in a, a position where they go down there feeling confident they can get it over the top of the Melbourne Storm. And it isn't the same Melbourne Storm that we've seen over the last couple of years. They've been knocked around by injury and uh, that leaves them vulnerable, um, depending on what Jerome Hughes does. If Hughes plays, I'm thinking the Storm might be might have enough. Uh, if Jerome Hughes doesn't play, wow, that's that's opened the door up for a, for a Canberra Raiders win. Um, so 
Yeah, it's a fascinating game, this one. Um, and Canberra are in good form. They've had a very good back end of the season, uh, led by their two front rowers and probably arrested Jack Whiten. So they're, they're the keys for the Raiders. Greg Alexander with us on the platform as we're talking the NRL week one of the finals. What storm side is, is, is going to turn up? Is it the first half side that actually blew the Panthers away and kept them scoreless? Um, or is it the side that got absolutely you know, physical out by the uh, Roosters? I mean, the, you know, and, and I suppose that's the unanswered question, isn't it? Uh, it is. Yeah, it is. Uh, I, I think they've got enough, you know, and the fact they are at home, uh, there won't be a, there won't be an out of sorts Melbourne side. Mel, Melbourne know what they have to do, and even though they are, you know, without a couple of their guns, they have been all season. Uh, Kristen Welsh, Pappenhausen, you know, have played very little football for the Storm this year, so uh, it will be up to Big Nelson and Brandon Smith to take them forward, and then Munster, you know, the arguably the most dangerous player in the competition is with, with the ball in his hand, um, unstructured, uh, can do anything, create anything from from nowhere and uh, I think that's what they rely on. They go forward from the big men, Harry Grant out of dummy half and um, then give the ball to Munster and see what he can do. I mean, this might sound like a really silly question, but is it almost like a handicap though for Munster, given the fact that Pappenhausen's not there? He's such a good player and can cover all those positions that they're kind of using him as a utility as opposed to getting him, as you say, with his hands on the ball and actually able to actually control the game. Yeah, I, I think, you know, even though he's playing fullback, even though you know, they keep naming him in six and they play him at fullback, uh, and if you're in, if you're defensively playing at the back, you, you are playing fullback. Where he gets the ball doesn't matter. Whether whether he's whether he's wearing the six or the one, he just gets the ball where and when he wants. So I, I don't think it's really much of a handbrake on him attacking-wise. The fact that he is playing fullback, I think he just involves himself wherever he pleases um, and and then just defends at the back, which he does such a great job at. So, yeah, I, I don't think it's such a... Uh, I don't think it's detrimental to their team, the fact that he is playing at the back. All right, let's talk uh, Sharks versus Cowboys. And this Sharks team has been superb for such a long time, but they're almost flying under the radar. They don't kind of get, to me, the kudos that they deserve for, for being the second-best side, but a, a really good side this year. Yeah, very good. You know, and and I think you know one of the success stories of the season have been the Sharks, unexpected. Um, you know, I know some had them in their eight, but certainly not as high as what they've finished. Craig Fitz has done a fantastic job with them, and and not surprising, having worked with him at Origin level for four years, I knew I knew what sort of coach he was he was going to be. So, uh, great job to get them there. Um, I just don't know what they're going to do in the finals. And you're right, they have flown under the radar. But when I went back and had a look at their last 10 performances, I'm thinking, oh, they've been a bit wishy-washy. Now, you know, I, they do get some players back for this one. Uh, Toby Rudolph comes back, Dalphin, who can a couple of, you know, very important inclusions in the, in the forward pack. Um, yeah, Will Kennedy uh, comes back to fullback, which will help them in terms of get their rhythm and, and, you know, what he means to the team. Uh, Connor Tracy's also back. So I, I don't know. It's, it's hard to get a read on the Sharks. Now, they are at home, which is an advantage. But are they good enough to beat the Cowboys, who um, have looked very good at times over the last, you know, half a dozen weeks? So I'm thinking the Sharks go in as favourites, but... I'm giving the Cowboys every chance to win this one. Are they playing on house money, Greg, given the fact of the year last year and how well they've done this year? We, do you think that they would have a mentality that is freer than most teams and going, hey, we're just here to play now? Uh, yeah, that would be an interesting way to approach it and, and certainly uh, you know, no pressure on them and low expectations can prove to make a dangerous team. But uh, I guess you know, low expectations on themselves, um, you know, mightn't get the best out of them. I, whatever whatever attitude they take into the game, um, they are chock full of uh, strike. They can score tries from anywhere, um, you know, drink water at the back. Uh, Nenai, uh, you know, out in the edge. Val Holmes, probably the best centre in the competition this year. Two great wingers. Townsend's kicking game and a forward pack, you know, up front, Tao Malolo, uh, Griffin Neem off the bench. You got Jordan McLean, 
um, they got the gee, they got they got some players, and if they put it all together, if they get it right, I, I, I think they can win. The, I, I think they can beat the Sharks. The Sunday game then, Roosters Rabbits. This has got to be a coin toss, surely. Two teams that don't like each other one little bit. You've heard the crowd go at um, at uh, Latrell over the last couple of times that they have played. I'm not looking at anything that happened last week, Greg. What about you? This is a one-off game. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Martin. I, I think you know. I, I was pretty confident the Roosters could get up on their on their home ground, their, the first game of their new home ground, to get up and win. I, I don't know how much weight that carries into this one. Uh, Cameron Murray will will likely play, and that was such a hammer blow for them to lose him in the second tackle of the game. You throw Damian Cook and Campbell Graham back into that South Sydney side. Uh, and you take Joey Manu out of the Roosters, and all of a sudden, wow! Well, you're thinking South. They, they, you know, they were outplayed in the opening 40 minutes comprehensively last week, but it won't take much to turn this around. And uh, I'm thinking that's a big chance of happening. I, I'm, you know, even though we're back at Roosters uh, HQ, I'm thinking South are a huge chance to turn the tables on the Roosters. Just a couple more questions, we'll let you go. And we thank you so much for your time and all your analysis as well. Just a couple of general questions. They always say, Greg, that um, defence wins championships. And looking at your mob last year, Penrith, uh, their their defence to win that title, just incredible. Keeping most teams, I think, under 10 or 12 points. And that's the key to it. Who's got the best defence out of these eight teams? Uh, Well, I I think the Panthers have. Uh, Defensive records would would suggest that Penrith, again, have the best defence uh, in the competition, uh, but there's all there's always a there, there's always a, a, a flip, flip side of that that you've got to be able to score points too. Um, you, you, there's, you can only do so much defending, but if your uh, attack uh, isn't what it should be, well, you just can't keep defending. Uh, so uh, we'll see whether the, the the combination of both marry up with the sides. But there's no doubt Penrith's defensive record over the year speaks for itself. The Cowboys have built their game around their defence. Todd Payton uh, said, well, we, we can't win a comp. We've got plenty of attack, but we can't win unless we improve our defence. Uh, and that has been the case right throughout the season. Melbourne, again, are a very good defensive side. So they're your three best defensive sides in terms of what's, what they've shown throughout the regular season. Uh, whether they can replicate that on game day in big games, uh, yeah, we, we we don't really know that, but uh, you can only go on what record what the records say that they've done through the season. Um, well, on that case, Martin, I'm thinking Penrith win the comp again, but okay. that's early. That's early doors. All right. <laughs> Look, uh, you know, it was 30 years ago you played your first grand final, 31 years ago since you won it um, in that historic occasion against Canberra. It might be 30 years and there might be sports scientists and PowerPoint presentations and nutrition and this and everyone's got an expert opinion and things. But has the emotional mindset changed when it it comes to playing finals football, Greg? I hope you say it hasn't because I kind of think that this is where you find out the true character of teams and players. Yeah, no, it hasn't changed. No, it's still the same. And that, and, that, and all those, all those, all those measurements that, that clubs use now, uh, whether it's science or um, whatever it is, it it's still doesn't change the emotion of surrounding a finals game. And um, and you're right, that's that's when players uh, stand up and be counted uh, individually, and that leads to you know the individuals that you know lead to a team performance. But uh, you're right, it becomes more personal. And it becomes uh, very tribal uh, around finals time, and uh, that's why we love it so much. And I, I, I honestly think that this year's final series is the closest that I can remember in a long time, where every team, any one of the eight teams, can win, uh, which makes it makes it fascinating. And is going to make it a, a great weekend of footy. Yeah, I'm so glad to hear you say that because the more the game goes professional, we're into metrics and optics and all of these other terms and things. I keep thinking the most basic emotional desires. It's about dreams, isn't it? It's about living what you've actually always wanted as a kid when you picked up a ball, isn't it? To actually be there at the time on the day when the when the when the whistle goes and you actually win. I mean, I can't even know what it must feel like, but I bet even with the day that you think about it, I bet it takes you straight back to 31 years ago, doesn't it? It does, and, 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 and the, the, 
the initial thing that I think of is what I said after the grand final, and I said, well, this is for the people of Penrith. And I think that's, that's what drives players. And, um, you know, I've, I've heard Nathan Cleary and Jerome Luai and Brian Tuttle and Stephen Crichton talk about the love of the area that they've grown up in. Um, you know, and even Nathan, who, you know, was a late comer, didn't, you know, didn't arrive into Penrith until he was in year seven or year eight. Um, the love he has of his district uh, is a driving force, and that's that's true of all the teams. You know, I've I've just come from a grand a, a, a breakfast in Parramatta, where there was Parramatta business people, and heard them talk about, you know, why they why they want to see the Eels win, and and it's it's about Parramatta, it's about the area, it's about you know the support and where they've grown up, and that's. That's what makes it great. It lasts forever, doesn't it? You know, you, can, you can't buy that. You, that. That's just something that, you know, you might have all the money, everything else in the world, but you can't buy that feeling, can you? No. No, it's unique. Well, eight teams, you reckon all of them have got a hell of a chance. What a great first week of finals football. Uh, every excuse you need to park up in front of the tally with four enormous games. Thank you so much for your time. Pleasure, Mark.